Greetings from Cyberdelic Space. This is Lorenzo, and I'm your host here in the Psychedelic Salon. Well, I've got a real treat for us today. This is another of the tapes that Jay sent me. And you remember Jay from last week's podcast, I'm sure. And thank you, Jay, for this blast from the past. What I'm about to play is another of the talks that were given at what the label calls UCSB Conference, May 1983. And it's titled, Psychoactive Drugs Throughout Human History. Now this talk was given by Dr. Andrew Weil, who at the time was at the very early stages of what has become quite a, a notable career as a professor, writer, and lecturer. And if you live in the States, you've uh, probably seen this big bushy bearded doctor on PBS, uh, and often during their pledge drives. But uh, don't get me going about PBS, the propaganda broadcasting system, because we've got uh, a lot more positive things to think about right now. Now, I hope you enjoy hearing this talk as much as I did when I heard it for the first time a couple of days ago. I know for sure that uh, some of our fellow Saloners are going to uh, enjoy it, particularly the ones who were with us at uh, what at the time was billed as the last great mushroom conference of the millennium. Uh, back then, uh, <laughs> we had quite a conference, and uh, in case you're wondering, no, it, it wasn't a conference about psychedelic mushrooms. Although, if I remember correctly, I think Ken Kesey did his best to bring the subject up a few times. But it was a fantastic conference, and everyone from Jonathan Ott to Sasha Shulgin gave presentations. And since it was held during the week of Halloween, we uh, had a costume party that I just now realized was the most memorable Halloween party of my life. I can't say for sure if uh, Dr. Weil was at that party because everybody was in costume that night. But I can say for sure that he's uh, a really approachable and a, a very nice person. And now we get to hear what he was thinking uh, about a quarter of a century ago. Now since uh, the MC from the conference does a great job of introducing Dr. Weil, I'm just going to turn on the old cassette recorder and we'll join the audience at the Psychedelics and Spirituality Conference in Santa Barbara, California back in 1983. And as we begin, uh, why don't you think back for a moment and consider where you were at the end of May in 1983 when the following took place. We are very fortunate to have with us uh, Dr. Andrew Weil, who is recognized uh, worldwide as perhaps uh, the definitive expert on uh, drugs, recreational, addictive, and medical. Uh, Dr. Weil is a research associate in ethnopharmacology at the Harvard Botanical Museum. He's an adjunct professor of addiction studies at Arizona State University. He is president of the Beneficial Plant Research Association, and he is the author of uh, Natural Mind, Marriage of the Sun and Moon, and uh, his new book, which has just been published by Houghton Mifflin, uh, Drugs, Chocolate to Morphine, uh, copies of which we hope to have available tomorrow. In the fall, he's going to have a new book out on health and healing, and I think we're in every way privileged and fortunate to have speaking with us tonight, Dr. Andrew Weil. Good evening. Uh, I'm going to depart from what the program says I'm going to talk about. Uh, first, because I think many of you have heard me talk about shamans and use of uh, uh, hallucinogenic plants in Central and South America, and also because I would rather talk more generally about the role of psychoactive substances in human life throughout history. Uh, I have been involved in the study of uh, psychoactive plants and drugs for over 20 years, and in that time, there are three things that I have learned about them. Uh, I, that many, some, some of them, the last one in particular, has crystallized only in the past two years. But I'd like to just tell you what those three things are. They're fairly simply stated, but it took me a long time to learn them. Uh, the first is that there are no good and ba or bad drugs. That drugs are what we make of them. They have good and bad uses. Uh, 
and that if you look around the world, the, the clearest pattern that you find is that every human culture is involved with drugs, with one or more. The only possible exception are the Eskimos who had the misfortune not to be able to grow drug plants and had to wait for us to give them alcohol, which they now abuse terribly. Uh, I know of no culture in the world at present or at any time in the past that has not been heavily involved with one or more psychoactive substances. But the usual pattern is that a culture will approve the use of one or a small number and at the same time disapprove the use of all the rest, especially those that other cultures use. But what's very interesting is that there's no agreement from culture to culture as to which are the good ones and which are the bad ones. Uh, if you are a Muslim, alcohol is the big bad drug. But the use of opium may be tolerated, the use of hashish may be tolerated. Uh, there is even a, an encouraged legitimate use in many Muslim countries of a, a stimulant leaf called khat, which is the closest thing that nature produces to amphetamine. Uh, some years ago I was in... Uh, Ethiopia with an anthropological expedition which is one of the major growing and using areas of cot. In that country, it is the Muslim minority which is the economic and socially deprived class that choose cot and the dominant Christians drink alcohol. And the Christians are trying to stamp out the use of cot as an evil drug which leads to amotivational syndrome or however they phrase it, it's the same thing. Uh, and they have invited the World Health Organization to come in and solve this terrible drug problem in their country. If you are uh, a, a mainstream American today, alcohol and it, caffeine uh, and tobacco are accepted drugs to the point that they're not even recognized for the drugs they are, despite the fact that alcohol, any way you look at it, is the most toxic and most dangerous of all psychoactive drugs in any sense, in terms of medical toxicity, behavioral toxicity. There is no other drug for which the, the association between crime and violence is so clear-cut or serious medical toxicity. And tobacco in the form of cigarettes is the most addictive of all drugs. There is no drug that comes close to the addictiveness of cigarettes in terms of how fast the addiction forms and how difficult it is to break and in what a high percentage of people who try that substance get hooked. Almost any drug you look at, you can find a substantial number of regular users who are not addicted. In the case of alcohol, maybe 90% of regular users of alcohol are not addicted. In the case of heroin and opiates, I don't know, there's no statistics, but I would guess that anywhere from 30 to 50% of regular users are not truly addicted, although some of them may get to be over time. But how many cigarette smokers do you know who can smoke one or two a day or one or two a week? They exist, but they're very rare. I think probably under 1%. And despite that fact, and despite the fact that that is one of the most obnoxious of drug habits and that it exposes non-users to the drug, and nothing else does that except marijuana, and there's very little public use of that. Uh, despite that fact, and despite the fact that the majority of cigarette addicts begin their addiction as teenagers, 90% of them, and that is well known, the industry that pervades that drug is supported by public tax money. Uh, I don't know whether any of you know this, but the, the columns on the Senate side of the Capitol building in Washington are decorated with tobacco leaves as a gesture of the economic importance of that crop in the economy of the United States, which happened after the, the, the growth of the modern cigarette industry, which led to addiction because it produced a cigarette that could be inhaled deeply and often. Uh, and created an industry for whose product was in total demand uh, led to the economic reconstruction of the South after the Civil War, and that is where that economic debt was owed. Well, given that, the extent of that, and the blindness that exists about the nature of that substance and what it is, you can just see the level of irrationality that pervades our culture. All the talk about drug dealing and drug dealers and pushers. I mean, what, what could be a more flagrant example of drug pushing than public support of that industry? Uh, again, I say there are no good drugs or no bad drugs. I think that, that tobacco may have legitimate uses, but in the form of cigarettes, its addictiveness is so great that my advice to a young person would be that if you're dying to know what tobacco is, chew it. Put some in your mouth or put powdered tobacco in your nose. That will tell you all you need to know about tobacco, and you'll have time to decide what you want to do about it. But if you experiment with cigarettes, the chances are overwhelming that you will be an addict before you know what's happened to you, and that's a very difficult addiction to break. Uh, and that's an example of what I would include in a, in a real drug education course, which I see very little of in this culture. Now, just to go on with this little survey, if, however, you are in a, in a subculture in this country, let's take the, say, an Indian in the Native American church, alcohol is, again, a terrible thing. 
Uh, the Native American church, which uses peyote sacramentally and, and uh, ritualistically, is the only approach, other than Alcoholics Anonymous, that I know of that has any success with alcoholism, which is notoriously resistant to any other form of treatment. So in that group, peyote is not a drug. If you call it a drug, that's a very bad thing to say about peyote. I mean, drugs are always what other people use. Uh, if you are in the Native American church, peyote is a sacrament or it's medicine, and tobacco is also. Tobacco is considered a sacrament, which is used along with peyote in a ritual setting, but alcohol is terrible. Marijuana is likely to be terrible. LSD is likely to be terrible. Uh, it's white man's uh, drug, not, not a natural sacrament. Well, you find this pattern again and again. You could go around. I know uh, uh, certain subcultures in this country that value the use of marijuana and all of the, uh, the psychedelic drugs, the indoles and phenethylamines, but are very condemning of things like uh, quaalude and barbiturates and medical drugs and sometimes coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. Uh, you, I know medical doctors that think that all, any products in the pharmaceutical industry are okay. They're medicines, but anything illegal is terrible and damaging. I mean, this is where the origin of uh, much drug research that sets out to prove the harmfulness of these unaccepted substances, which has led to terrible blunders in the medical literature. I think the, the classic of which was the uh, dissemination of the story that LSD broke chromosomes that was published in the country's leading medical journal, the New England Journal of Medicine, and endorsed editorially in that same issue with a very prominent editorial saying this was a highly important article that everybody should be aware of. It was terrible research. And what was terrible about it should have been apparent at the time the article was submitted. And legitimate experiments to test the hypotheses that L LSD broke chromosomes were not done until some time later, and they consistently showed that there was no effect on chromosomes. That research was difficult to get published, did not generate publicity in the media, and to this day, 10 years later, I meet people that think LSD has adverse effects on genetic material, which it doesn't at all. That just is an example of how even medical scientists can get involved in the same kind of irrationality and prejudice about good drugs and bad drugs. Uh, so that the ones that you accept are okay and the ones everybody else uses are terrible. Well, this is, as I say, one thing that I have learned. I don't think there is such a thing as a good drug or a bad drug. I think you can, make, you can use any drug wisely or stupidly. And any drug that you care to name, I can show you people that use it intelligently. Maybe for some drugs that will be a small percentage of users. Uh, and I can show you people that use it uh, stupidly. Even drugs that have terrible reputations. You know, look at... And, uh, you know, heroin has an awful reputation in this culture. I can show you people who use heroin productively, for whom it reduces anxiety, enables them to function normally socially, and lead productive lives. I don't know what percentage of total users they are. Obviously, many other people don't do that, and they use it abusively. I, I see a great failure in, in the world in general to distinguish between drug use and drug abuse. And that is a variant on this theme of good and bad drugs. It's you, a phrase that's become very popular in the drug literature is drug of abuse. That there are such things as drugs of abuse. Well, that's just a fancy way of saying a bad drug, one that you disapprove of. And the idea behind it is that anyone who uses such a substance is automatically an abuser. Well, that, that is a meaningless definition of drug abuse. I think that a, a useful definition of drug abuse, and one that I use, is that it's the use of any substance, whether it's legal or not, or approved or not, in such a way that it seriously threatens a person's health or their social or economic functioning in the world. Uh, if, if a use of a substance doesn't do that, in my mind, that is not abuse. There are many uses that people have put drugs to in the world. Uh, everything from just recreation to having a good time to an excuse for social interaction. Look at the function of, the, uh, of coffee and alcohol in our culture as, a, as providing excuses for people to relate to each other. Many people, if deprived of those drugs, would be unable to talk to other people. Uh, I mean, coffee, having a coffee break is a legitimate excuse for stopping work and interacting with somebody. That's very parallel to uses of coca leaves in, uh, in Andean Indian cultures, uh, to the use of cot, the leaf that I mentioned in the Middle East. That is a long tradition for use of psychoactive substances. In this culture, many people take psychoactive drugs to rebel, especially the disapproved drugs. That's something I think we have created by the attempts that we've made to control substances through prohibitions. That's one of the worst effects of drug prohibitions is that they encourage people. First of all, I think they stimulate curiosity about drugs on the part of young people. The reason the age of experimentation with marijuana and other drugs has dropped so much in recent years is because we've made them forbidden and attractive. Many kids who would never care to try drugs do so only because we have made them prohibited. 
uh, I have been consistently struck in my work with Indian tribes, in, especially in the Amazon, where drugs like coca leaf and psychedelics are available all the time but are used only by adults under certain circumstances. Uh, there are no laws or prohibitions governing that. That's just the way you do things in that society. I've been very struck at the total absence of curiosity on the part of children about those drugs. There's a tribe of Indians called Cubeos that I have lived with a lot on the eastern border of Colombia near Brazil in the Amazon basin who use coca, powdered coca, as a daily stimulant and social drug, but it's mostly a drug of adult men. I have asked children in that tribe again and again, don't you want to know what coke is like? And they say no. And I said, well, aren't you, don't you want to know what it does to you? And they say, well, we'll wait till we grow up. That's very different from anything I hear up here. <laughs> and I think, that that is, I think that is very much related to the absence of trying to deal with that through, uh, through prohibitions and making things unavailable and then trying to defend the prohibitions by greatly exaggerating the dangers of disapproved drugs while not acknowledging the, the dangers of the drugs that are in current use. Uh, the, the variants on good drug and bad drug are very frequent. Uh, you hear legitimate drugs, medical drugs, illicit drugs. Uh, I think the attempt to um, use names like entheogen is really another variant of that. It may be more benign, but it's a way of saying that our drugs, say especially the indoles and phenethylamines, are okay, <laughs> but uh, quaaludes and barbiturates and opiates aren't very good. You know, I just don't believe that. I think, uh, and especially when you look at the uses of drugs for religious purposes or spiritual purposes, that is another very prominent theme in human culture. Uh, another very common use in all cultures of psychoactive substances is to give people transcendent experiences, to allow them to transcend their human and ego boundaries, to feel more greater contact with the supernatural or with the spiritual or with the divine, however they phrase it in their terms. And you may or may not approve of that, but it is a fact of human life. And the drugs that have been used for that purpose are very varied. There is no one category. There are many people who claim to have found God and spiritual life through alcohol. That's a very old tradition going back to ancient cultures. Uh, and, and it persists to this day in occasional people. Uh, there, is, there are people who say they have found God through opiates. There are people, and now, of course, the ones that we hear this most about are the, are the ones that you will be hearing most about in this conference, uh, which in the past have been called hallucinogens and psychedelics, and now entheogens. I don't think we can find a, you know, a totally satisfactory name to them, because it either, it, 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 every name is either one put forward by the opponents of those drugs or the proponents of them, and it gets into the same kind of, of uh, fight. Uh, but at any rate, this is a fact of human life. Now, it's also, of course, interesting that people find, have spiritual experiences through many other techniques that don't involve drugs at all. People do it through fasting, they do it through chanting, through praying, through associating with gurus, uh, through attending organized religious pageants or procedures. It seems to me what all that suggests is that that uh, spiritual that there's, drugs don't have spiritual potentials. Human beings have spiritual potentials. And it may be that we need techniques to move us in that direction. And the use of psychoactive drugs clearly is one path that has helped many people. Now, because in our culture today, many of the drugs that people use for that purpose are disapproved drugs, that has led critics of that kind of use to complain that spiritual experiences obtained through drugs are not legitimate. Well, I think you could make that argument about any other technique that people use. I mean, why are, why are spiritual experiences obtained through fasting not legitimate? I mean, legitimate and drug use not. Uh, it seems to me that the only test of whether spiritual experiences are legitimate are what effect they have on the person. I mean, if a person who has, uh, say, who has never thought about the spiritual side of things until they've had a drug experience, then manifests spirituality in their life and pursues other sorts of spiritual activities, that seems to me that that was a genuine spiritual experience. If somebody just continues to take drugs over and over, maybe that was not a legitimate spiritual revelation. I don't think it has anything to do with the technique. I think it has to do with the person and the effect that that, that technique has had on that person. Uh, I think that the, it's also clear that uh, from the latest kinds of research that are going on that are very exciting in brain chemistry, suggest that the line between what is natural and what is not is very unclear because it looks as if the brain makes analogs of most of the drugs that people use. Uh, I don't know that we, no one has found an analog of THC in marijuana at the moment, uh, but the one that has, of course, received the most attention are the endorphins, the opiate analogs that our brains make, 
we clearly make our own stimulants in the form of, of neurotransmitters like uh, dopamine and noradrenaline. We make our own downers in the form of chemicals like serotonin and GABA. Uh, we probably make our own antidepressants, possibly in the form of, uh, of sex hormones. Uh, we make our own psychedelics, I am sure, almost certainly DMT, uh, which is probably produced by the pineal, or if not it, something very close to it. Uh, I think we, we make the, all these things ourselves. Now, that raises a lot of interesting questions. Why is it that the human brain and plants should have the same chemicals in them? Why, why are the indoles and tryptamines so widely distributed in nature? DMT occurs, uh, you know, these indole drugs occur in everything from mushrooms to higher plants to the human brain. You know, why, why is that? What is, what are the, why are those chemicals so widely distributed? It may well be that when people have transcendent experiences by means of techniques like fasting and chanting and praying, that there is a final common pathway that's mediated through similar brain neurotransmitters. Maybe when people wake up feeling spontaneously high one day, their endorphin system is in high gear and they're not bothered by things that ordinarily would get them down. Maybe the people who are likely to become dependent on opiates are people who have a deficiency of endorphins and so experience what the rest of us experience as ordinary the ordinary bothers of life as overwhelmingly painful. You know, if that's the case, uh, I would suspect that when you try to deal with that problem by taking an opiate from outside, you probably totally shut off your body's own production of those chemicals, and maybe that creates the biochemical basis for withdrawal and addiction. And if that's so, then, then the, uh, the, the most useful approach to treating addiction would be to find ways of stimulating the body's own production of that chemical to solve the deficiency, not to supply it with an, with an external analog of it. Well, this is clearly an, an important area of research that we'll hear a lot more about in future years. Also, it's, it's amazing that it's not just natural drugs that appear to have analogs in the brain. They, we have now found a Valium receptor in the brain. What does that mean? Valium is a synthetic drug that was created in a laboratory. Was, were Valium receptors always there? Did people think up Valium because they had Valium receptors in their brains? <laughs> Did uh, have Valium receptors evolved in response to use of Valium in the world? I don't know. It's a very interesting question. Uh, there is a PCP re receptor that has just been found in the brain. What does that mean? You know, this is a very e interesting area of the interface between uh, brain and the external world and drugs that may be the mediators of experiences. Uh, I think that also is further evidence that, you know, you can't say that because a person has an experience in one way or another that one is legitimate and one is not. That's not the test. As I say, I think the only fair test is what effect it has on the person and what effect that person subsequently has on other people and the world. Now, this is all to do with the first lesson that I have learned from my studies, namely that there are no good drugs or bad drugs. The second uh, thing that I have clearly learned is that the effects of drugs are as much dependent on expectation and setting, on set and setting, as they are on pharmacology. That we shape the effects of drugs. That all drugs do is make you feel temporarily different physically and psychologically. They may alter your perceptual mechanisms, they may, may alter your body sensations, they may alter your level of alertness or wakefulness, uh, they may give you feelings of butterflies in your stomach, but that's all they do. The experiences that you have on drugs are the products of our minds, that you take the raw material of that physical pharmacological effect and turn it into whatever you want. And you can turn it into polar opposites. You can turn the same drug into a terrifying experience of being poisoned, into a divine experience of spiritual revelation, uh, into a feeling of overwhelming bliss and love for other people, into paranoia, into depression, into anything. Uh, I could give you example after example of the, the ways that the mind can shape pharmacology. Uh, I, I don't have time to do that. There's wonderful, uh, Jonathan Ott, who was here, uh, and I once uh, were interested in cases of people who ate uh, a mushroom in Washington, the panther amanita, that maybe he can say a word about, since this contains chemicals he's very interested in. And the difference between people who ate that mushroom accidentally and who experienced it as mushroom poisoning and thought they were about to die, and on the other hand, people who ate it deliberately looking for a psychedelic effect and found that in it is very striking. Uh, complete shaping of pharmacology, and I think all drugs work that way. You know, the drugs don't contain experiences. Uh, we shape pharmacological effects into the experiences 
that we are looking for, and that is not necessarily a conscious process. It has to do with unconscious expectation. It has to do with cultural definition of a drug. That, again, makes it very difficult. It, it again, points up the folly of talking about good and bad drugs because the effects of drugs are totally variable. They vary from culture to culture. They vary from age of history to age of history. Marijuana, as it's used today in the United States, is not what marijuana was 100 years ago when it was used medically in the form of a tincture. Uh, and if you read the reports of uses of marijuana in medicine in the 19th century, people didn't report getting high on it. There's very little of that in the literature. If, if they did, they probably, first of all, they may not have noticed it because they weren't led to expect that. Or if they did notice something happening, they might have considered it no more important than the experience that many people get on medical drugs of feeling drowsy or dizzy or altered in some way, that you just consider that a side effect of medication and don't think it's anything to write home about. That's very different. And it's also very different from marijuana as it was used in ancient India as a religious sacrament in certain circles. That has a very different cultural definition of what to look for in that drug. So the, the, the effects of drugs can be completely shaped by cultural expect expectation, by individual expectation, by setting as well. As just an example of the, the uh, powerful effects of setting on pharmacology, a, a colleague of mine, Dr. Norman Zinberg, is a psychoanalyst at Harvard Medical School, uh, was some years ago uh, commissioned by the U.S. Army, this was during the Vietnam War, to study heroin use among troops in Vietnam, which was a major problem. Heroin was very cheap, it was very available, very strong, and a very high percentage of American men in Vietnam began using heroin, usually smoking it. Uh, pharmacologists would have predicted, based on what they know of just of the pharmacology of heroin, that that kind of usage would have resulted in pharmacological addiction. And that those people, when they came back to the United States, would be heroin addicts. And that the ranks of heroin addicts in the United States would have swelled enormously. Well, Zinberg, who is a great, uh, who, like me, is a very uh, great believer in the effects of set and setting, felt from interviewing lots of heroin users in Vietnam that the main reason that people got into heroin smoking over there, apart from its availability, was as a way of dealing with boredom of army life in Vietnam, because for many people over there, the, the dominant theme of army life in Vietnam was boredom. And one of the effects of heroin is to make time pass more quickly in a boring situation. And he felt that, that from his understanding of the importance of setting and shaping pharmacology, that in fact, when most of these men came home, that they wouldn't have any problem with heroin because the conditions that caused that usage would have disappeared. And he was right. And that was been completely borne out by follow-up studies of army people who came back to the United States and just left off using heroin. There was no motivation to use it again. They didn't have go through withdrawal. They didn't become dependent on heroin. They didn't, the ranks of domestic heroin addicts didn't go up. It's a completely different prediction from what classical pharmacology would have predicted. Well, as I said, I could give you example after example of this, but I don't have time. The, the third lesson that I have learned, and this has just become much clearer to me in recent years, is the importance of what pharmacologists call pharmacokinetics. That is the, the way in which a drug is introduced and distributed through the body and to the target organs and tissues that it affects. In, in classical pharmacology, there is a principle that is very well known and taught, and yet I think few people pay attention to the significance of it, and that is that the effect of a drug is more dependent on the rate of increase of its concentration in the bloodstream than on the absolute dose. So that a very large dose of a drug given slowly has a much milder effect than a much smaller dose of a drug given suddenly. Now that's a very well understood principle in pharmacology, but it has ramifications that I think people have not followed through. The manner of introducing a drug into the body is crucially determinant of the effects that people experience, and especially of its adverse effects, both short-term and long-term. The toxicity of drugs, their abuse potential, their addictiveness goes up exponentially as you find ways of introducing them into the, into the blood and brain more directly. Now, I used to think that the most direct way of introducing a drug into the body was by intravenous injection. It's not. Smoking is. And if you think about it, it's very clear why that is. When you inject a drug into a vein in the arm, it's diluted in a relatively large concentration of venous blood. It first goes to the heart, then to the lungs, then back to the heart, and then up to the brain. When you smoke a drug, it goes into a small volume of arterial blood, goes in one pass to the, from the lungs to the heart and up to the brain.
So the concentrations that are delivered to the brain centers responsive to it are much higher, and the acceleration, the rate of change of concentration, which is the crucial factor, is greater. You can look at drugs, the same drug, I think the easiest one to see this with is cocaine, on a spectrum of usages ranging from Indians who chew coca leaves to people who smoke the freebase form of cocaine. And you see day and night differences. There is no relationship between what happens to people who smoke cocaine base and to what happens to people who suck on coca leaves. They look like totally different drugs. <laughs> and that has to do with, principally, with the, the pharmacokinetics, with the manner of introducing a drug into the system. When uh, just to summarize this very briefly, the reason that natural drugs, that plant drugs, are so much easier to integrate into a culture and to individual life is that they're naturally dilute preparations and that the mechanics of them force you to generally to put them into your body through the mouth and stomach, which is the safest way to introduce a drug. Not only does that uh, allow the body time to process it, it diffuses slowly into the system. Usually the drugs are bound up in plant tissue. They diffuse out slowly. That is very determinant of what happens to people when they take drugs. Uh, just one, one reason for that, and that's a clear one, and I think many users of drugs don't understand, is that when you take a drug into your digestive system, there is a large circulation called the portal circulation in which blood comes from the intestines to the liver, and its liver is the main processor of chemicals coming into the body, and it then enters the general circulation. When you take a drug by injection or by smoking or by snorting, you bypass that circulation. So you are introducing drugs in an unprocessed form directly into the bloodstream. That greatly increases their toxicity, their tendency to cause adverse reactions, their tendency to cause addiction and dependence over time. Again, it doesn't matter what the drug is. You can, you can form abusive relationships with any of these things, and, and taking a drug by mouth doesn't guarantee that you won't but it gives you a better chance of staying in a stable relationship with a substance over time. One of the characteristics about traditional cultures who use um, uh, preparations of plants for socially acceptable purposes is that they tend not to refine the plants as we do. They use them in crude form. Uh, and they generally put them into their body through their mouth and stomach. I mean, and, and some, obviously there are some very simple reasons for that. You can't snort a coca leaf. You can't shoot opium into your vein. Uh, that is a natural safeguard about crude botanical preparations of drugs. I think it's unfortunate that in this culture we have fallen so much into the habit of relying on refined, purified derivatives of plants in highly concentrated form, both for recreational drugs and for medicine, and have fallen into the habit of thinking that this is somehow more scientific and more effective, that botanical drugs are old-fashioned, unscientific, messy. Uh, in fact, they're much safer. Sometimes the quality of the effects are better. That's not to say we should do away with purified drugs. They have their place. Sometimes you want very rapid, immediate, intense effects, uh, and it's nice to have those in your back pocket, but it, there ought to be a balance between the two, and we have lost that in medicine today. Uh, most doctors wouldn't know what to do with a coca leaf if you gave it to them. Or they wouldn't know what to do with an aloe plant if you gave it to them. Uh, they wouldn't know what to do with digitalis leaves if you gave it to them as a treatment for heart failure. We, there should be a balance between these two. Well, as I say, these are, the, uh, these are the, the three most important lessons I have learned from my studies of drugs. And they all sum up, really, to the fact that drugs are what we make them. Uh, that it's we who determine whether drugs are destructive or whether they're beneficial. It's not any inherent property of drugs. And you can look at the history. It's fascinating to look at the history of drugs and to see how they've changed over time. I mean, coffee was an entheogen in the old days when it was first discovered. Its first use was by groups of early Muslim mystics who took it up as a once-a-week ritual. They would, groups of men would meet, I think, on Thursday nights and drink large quantities of coffee and stay up all night chanting and praying until dawn. And it was clearly recognized, this was believed, coffee was thought to be a magical plant that had special properties. It could induce spiritual experiences. We didn't use it all the time. If you don't use coffee all the time, it's a very powerful drug. It's a very powerful stimulant. Another very clear principle of pharmacology and, and uh, drug studies is that when you use any drug frequently, the effects begin to disappear. The body adapts to it. You know, there's a wonderful... Uh, there was a, a great physiologist named Walter Cannon who in, proposed the term homeostasis in, in the early years of this century. That is the principle that it means remaining the same, staying the same. And it's the principle that no matter how you try to throw the body off equilibrium, it will tend to return to equilibrium. And the image that I have of that, do you remember those? I'm sure they still make them, but I remember when I was a kid there were these... Uh, 
I, I think of them as schmooze. Those, I'm, I'm sure they're all different forms, but these kind of plastic toys that are weighted in the bottom. And any way you shove it down, it bounces back up. Well, that's how the organism is. And any time you put a force in and move it in one direction, it tends to move back. So there's a reactive component. And that's very clear in the case of drugs. That you give any drug, you give a stimulant, it will be followed by depression. Uh, you, give it a, uh, you give a drug that makes you feel high, sometime later you're going to feel down. And if you use any drug frequently, the body will neutralize it. So that as you take it, a, a drug very frequently, the interesting effects that you get at the beginning stop. Look at the way coffee is used today. Its entheogenic potential has disappeared completely. Most people drink it only because they don't feel normal without it anymore, which is, a, which, is, which is the essence of drug dependence. That's just what happens. Drugs create their own need. The more you use them, the more you need them just to feel normal. That's how the body reacts to neutralize anything. And I think that's both a physical process and a mental process. There, uh, Norman Zinberg, again, the study that he's involved in now, is looking at the ways that the second member of a family to be put on phenothiazines, that's tranquilizers like Thorazine, reacts. So that if one member of a family goes crazy and they're put on, on Thorazine, let's say, often the response is adequate. But if a second member of the family later requires treatment with the same sorts of drugs, it's much less effective. There's a much lower incidence of success in a second person in a family. It's as if people somehow learn to compensate for the effect of a drug. So I think that can be both be a learning effect and a physical effect, but it's a very clear principle. And with some drugs, that happens terribly fast, as in the case of putting tobacco into your system by smoking. With others, it may happen relatively slowly. Chocolate, same thing, was an entheogenic drug. We have the, the world's expert on chocolate is sitting over here, Mr. Ott, who I hope will say something about that. He's written the definitive book on chocolate. Uh, the name, the botanical name of chocolate, theobroma, means food of the gods. Chocolate was considered a sacred plant by Indians of, of southern Mexico. Uh, it is not, doesn't behave very much as a sacred plant today, maybe for a few people. Uh, and, you know, the same principle holds to these drugs that we're calling entheogens here tonight. They don't have any inherent potential to put people in touch with the divine or the absolute ground of being. That's up to us, whether we use them that way or make them work that way. And if they're overused and if people take them very frequently and if they become ordinary and commonplace, that potential will disappear as surely as it has with all the others. Tobacco, for that matter, too, was a... Uh, when it first came to the, uh, the, new, the old world, uh, it was a magical plant from the new world. The, the Spanish, when they found the uh, uh, Indians smoking, had no word even in their vocabulary for smoking. They described it as drinking. They saw people drinking smoke. Uh, there was no smoking in the old world before 1492. All the hashish and opium that were, eaten in Europe, were used in Europe and Asia were eaten. Nobody got the idea of smoking them. Uh, when tobacco first came to Europe, it was used as a magical, precious substance. It was also so harsh. This is, as I said earlier, that cigarette addiction doesn't take back very far because early forms of tobacco were so harsh you couldn't inhale them deeply or often. You could just take one or two tokes on it. But people who did that used it much as marijuana was used in this culture more recently. That is, you took this to have a major alteration in consciousness, that everything whirled around and you fell over on the ground, and social authorities were horrified at what they saw. <laughs> and of course, if you think about it, who is going to use a new drug when it comes into the culture? It's not going to be the establishment, it's going to be the deviants. It's going to be... <laughs> so, the, the ways that the, the culture thinks about drugs are very much shaped by who first gets their hands on it. And by and large, the people in a culture to first get their hands on a new drug are not going to give it a very good reputation. They're going to be very feared by the, the mainstream culture. Uh, and that happened with tobacco. And it's very interesting to look at the history of what happened with laws as tobacco went eastward. It first got to Spain, and then England, and then France, and it marched around the world to the east. In uh, Russia and Turkey, Turkey of all places, which became so... Uh, closely associated with tobacco, the death penalty was imposed for possession of tobacco with, for the first 10 or 15 years after it was there. That did not work, as prohibitions against drugs never work. And I think legislatures who still dream that you can somehow affect people's drug-taking behavior in any way except for the worse by passing laws should go back and look at the history of the anti-tobacco legislation in the 1500s. It did not work. What did happen, however, was that as tobacco became more commonplace and it lost its significance as a magical plant and people began to use it more frequently, it also lost its power to alter consciousness, possibly in an interesting way for many people. So the main message I would just like to leave you with at the opening of this conference is that, as I say, there are no good drugs or bad drugs. Drugs are what we make of them. 
the interesting, what we talk about as the interesting potentials of drugs are really the interesting potentials of us. Uh, and drugs are one way of realizing those potentials. And for some people, they may prove to be legitimate. So I'll thank you there. I'd be happy to answer a few questions. Yeah, um, uh, well, I run a lot, and I'm just curious. Um, when I smoke, like, indic I think it's indica. I may be wrong. That's why I'm asking this. Um, is sativa a less harsh marijuana, or is there such a thing as a less harsh marijuana that, that is a breed or a... Um, well, I'm sure there are harsher and less harsh varieties of marijuana, but I suspect that has as much to do with the way that it was cured and dried and uh, with tar content and the moisture content as much as it does on, uh, on resin content. I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I think uh, you know, that, that how harsh the smoke is really varies with a lot of things. There is research that shows that marijuana smoke has more tars in it than tobacco smoke, and some people have uh, tried to make it, uh, that into uh, implying that it's also more irritating. I think that the irritation of smoke has a lot to do with how much you take in over time. And most tobacco smokers take in much more smoke than marijuana smokers. You know also that um, the runner's high, as it's been called, uh, has been shown to be neutralized uh, in part or in great amount by giving people narcotic antagonists, uh, which block the effects of opiates. And that suggests that the endorphin system, which are the brain's own opiate analogs, are at work in that. And that might be another example of the way that what we call natural highs really may have the same final common pathway as highs that people experience when they take analogous substances from plants. Well, there has been a lot of that research. Uh, I'm not very familiar with the literature. There's uh, uh, one person who's done a lot of that is Stanley Krippner. Um, and the, I'm, I'm sure you could track a lot of that down through the Association for Transpersonal Psychology, uh, which is in the San Francisco area, and publishes a journal called Transpersonal Psychology. Uh, again, I think, you know, that, that those kinds of potentials are potentials of the human mind, and that's possibly one way of releasing them. Uh, some of the psychedelic drugs have particularly been associated with that, and the, the use of yahe or ayahuasca in um, Amazonian Indian cultures uh, is often credited with making, with giving people visions that have uh, valid content. I uh, spent time with one shaman in uh, Colombia who was an ayahuasquero, a yajero, who was main uh, method of, he was a healer who mostly worked with sick people and would cook up a brew of this plant that has uh, a group of chemicals called beta carbolines. Harmaline is one of them. They're related to tryptamines and the other indoles. And uh, one uh, kind of use that he made of it, he, he would often be consulted by uh, people who had had a missing person in their families who would come to him with a photograph, say, and uh, he would then take this drug and in his vision see the whereabouts of the person. Now, I, I didn't get a chance to verify any of this, but he would give people very specific information about you know, what had happened to the person. And, and in that culture, there was great belief in the validity of these kinds of visions. Yeah, uh, back there. Well, I don't have time to speak at length about it, uh, and there are other people here. There are other people here who might be better qualified to do that. Uh, Terence McKenna, who is down down here, knows more about that than I. Uh, dimethyltryptamine is a um, is one of the tryptamine family of drugs that's widely distributed in plants, and as I said, is almost certainly made by the pineal gland in the brain. Uh, it, it itself uh, can't be taken by mouth because it's inactivated by an enzyme in the stomach, so people usually smoke it, uh, occasionally inject it. It's not very common up here at the moment. Uh, it's, it occurs in a lot of plants that have been put to use, in, especially in South America, uh, by South American Indians. Uh, when taken, it's often mixed with yahe, this other drug that I mentioned, and in that form is orally active because the chemicals in yahe inactivate the enzyme in the stomach that breaks it down. And in that form, it's a long, much longer acting drug. Uh, it has a, uh, uh, it is especially visual. It's one of the, the psychedelic drugs that affects the visual system strongly. And Indians in those cultures who value visions and take these plants, I mean, their interest in taking these plants is not just to get intoxicated, it's to have visions. That's what they place the premium on, and they say that they get valid information from their visions. And it's interesting that if you interview these, uh, uh, when, when this practice first came to light in South America of mixing uh, leaves containing DMT, 
into a drink that was made from this other plant, yahe, the, the first pharmacologist who learned that said that the leaves couldn't possibly have an effect because DMT is broken down in the stomach. The Indians say they put the leaves in to make the visions brighter. And if you ask anthropologists and botanists how Indians hit upon that, you know, when it turns out that, that harmaline uh, uh, inhibits the enzyme that breaks down DMT. So in that combination, you produce an orally active form of DMT. When you ask an anthropologist or botanist, how could Indians discover such a thing? Uh, they always answer trial and error. And somehow when you hear that up in a university library, you know, it goes by and it sounds all right. But when you're sitting down in the middle of the jungle with these people, it just doesn't... I can't see Indians every day saying, well, today let's try this leaf. <laughs> and if you ask the Indians, they give, always give a very consistent answer. They say that they learned it in visions, that Yahe told them in visions to get this leaf and add that to make the visions brighter. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you all hear that? All right, the question was that how do I reconcile what I was saying about the importance of expectation, especially unconscious expectation, with the healing power of drugs, especially as demonstrated in a scientific setting? Well, you know, the healing power of drugs is very interesting. It also, like the mystical power of drugs, is very evanescent. Uh, there is a, a famous medical aphorism uh, that I've tried to track down, but it's been attributed to at least six different physicians of the early part of this century. One of them was a man named William Osler, who was a professor at Johns Hopkins University. And it is, a new drug should be used as much as possible while it still has the power to heal. Uh, if you look at the history of pharmaceutical drugs, there is a very clear pattern that the incidence of favorable responses is greatest near the time of introduction, and that over a period of 10 or 20 years, the percentage of favorable responses to the drug diminishes. I could give you many examples of that. I think one that's a very good one, a current one, is the, the painkiller Darvon, uh, propoxyphene, which was introduced into medical practice, I think, in the early sometime in the 1950s, and was widely touted by its manufacturer as being a big breakthrough in pain relief because it filled the gap between morphine and aspirin, which is a real problem in medicine, that we have no intermediate strength painkillers. We have uh, things that work well for mild pain and things that work well for severe pain, but the ones for severe pain have a strong addictive potential, and uh, there's nothing in between. So propoxyphene, which is an opiate, uh, and marketed under the brand name Darvon, was introduced as being a intermediate strength painkiller with a very low abuse potential and was widely used and enthusiastically uh, uh, taken up by doctors. In about 10 years after its introduction, it first became apparent that it had a significant abuse potential when heroin users turned, up who turned, turned out to like injecting it into themselves. There were also combinations of Darvon that were made available, some combined with aspirin and some combined with phenacetin, which is the... Uh, you know, an, an, another common uh, over-the-counter painkiller. In, in recent years, over the past 10 years, there has been general acknowledgement by physicians that Darvon isn't a very good drug, that in fact it doesn't relieve pain very well. And I think the general consensus now in the medical community is that when these Darvon combinations work, they mostly work because they contain aspirin or phenacetin. And suddenly the drug is looking not very good. Now, it's interesting that the way that physicians interpret that pattern and the, and the incidence of people who respond favorably to Darvon has declined greatly. The, the way that physicians interpret that is that Darvon wasn't a very good drug to begin with, but it took us this long to realize that. Now, I don't think that's what happened. I think what happened was that there is tremendous faith which is a variety of expectation, in novelty. And that the novel products are able to catalyze healing responses more effectively than familiar products. And I think you can see that principle at work in a lot of healing phenomena. There's a... Uh, I was very interested in... Uh, uh, I, I did some research on what's been found out about healings that have occurred at miracle shrines. The, the one that has been studied most is Lourdes in France. Uh, there are clear-cut cases, although not where the percentage out of total people that go there is small, of people that have had very clear-cut cures of advanced organic conditions. Uh, no native of Lourdes has ever been cured there. The, 
the chances of a person being healed at Lourdes seem to be, this is based on a statistical study of a lot of people that went there, are proportional, directly proportional to the length of the journey traveled to get there. <laughs> Which is, I think is another measure of the investment of faith. Now, I don't think that means, you know, in saying this, I'm not saying that drugs do nothing. Uh, in fact, as I said earlier, drugs, I mean, they have intrinsic pharmacological effects, but what the final experiences are is a product of the creative interpretation of them by the human mind. And one of the crucial factors in that is expectation, and unfortunately it's not simply conscious expectation. That would make it much simpler to specify all this. You can sit a person down in a laboratory and ask them what they think is going to happen to them when you give them an experimental dose of a drug, and they may reel off something, and it may have no relation to what, on a deeper level, they think or fear is going to happen to them. And it's on the deeper level that counts, because that's the part of the mind that connects up with the machinery of the body that determines physical responses. Um, but I think that that's completely consistent with what I see with, with healing properties of drugs. Sure, there are certain drugs that have direct effects that may contribute to healing, but I think healing, like religious experience, is an innate potential of the body. It's not something that comes in a drug. All a drug can do is give you a push in a certain direction, and I think that even their expectation plays a great role in that. An example of that is that look at the... You know, one of, one of the commonest forms of bad medicine that I see practiced today is the prescription of antibiotics for viral sore throats. Antibiotics have no effect on viruses. Uh, often these are given out by doctors who don't bother to do throat cultures, and the vast majority of sore throats are viral in origin. And despite the fact that I deplore that kind of medicine, uh, because it makes, one of, the, one of the worst reasons is that it makes the antibiotics less effective for the rest of us because it, it breeds resistant germs in those people. Uh, that despite that, it's very easy to collect cases of cures of viral sore throats by antibiotics. When other methods had failed, people had gargled and done this and that, and it hadn't gone away, and they're given tetracycline, and 36 hours later, they're cured. Now, what happened there? I mean, the drug is an active drug. It's not a sugar pill. So it did something. It might have altered body chemistry. It might have altered bacterial flora in the body. But I think the healing response that happened mostly had to do with belief in antibiotics, which is very strong, not just on the part of patients, but on the part of doctors. And I think it's the faith of doctors in their techniques is at least as important as the faith of patients, because that's communicated on a very real level, just as a shaman's belief in their methods are communicated to patients. On the other hand, you can find equal instances where an antibiotic like tetracycline fails to cure a urinary infection that it ought to cure where you had germs that were susceptible and it looked as if it should work. You know, what happened there? So it's not just a mechanical matter of a drug doing something purely pharmacologically, that even in the case of active drugs, there is enormous room for influence of expectation and setting. Yeah. All a double-blind experiment can do is establish the intrinsic efficacy of a drug relative to an inactive control. It gives no information about what will happen in an individual clinical setting when that drug is used. And in fact, by succeeding in, in double-blind trials, a drug is going to elicit greater placebo effects because it will have a thicker coating of belief by the, on the part of the doctors who prescribe it. Okay, well, I'll stop. We have to go. You know, I couldn't help but think while I was listening to Dr. Weil with you just now, what a wonderfully different world it would be if this talk had not only been broadcast on all the radio and TV networks, but also if everyone who heard it also got it. It's, uh, it's really hard to believe how far we've regressed in the past 25 years when it comes to an understanding of the importance of psychedelic medicines. Personally, uh, I believe that it is a crime against humanity that these drug warriors are committing. But like all warriors throughout history, you know, from the Huns to the Visigoths to the Christian Crusaders, all of those bloodthirsty warriors eventually fade into the dust uh, as we humans once again rebuild our Gaian civilizations. Or, uh, or I could just be dreaming all of this. Or maybe the dreamer is you. Or, <laughs> maybe I better remind you once again that I've had the honor of kissing the Blarney Stone, not once, but twice. And uh, that I also once practiced law in Texas, where my license to lie is still current. 
So be really careful about taking me too seriously. Uh, the truth is, I, I don't really have a clue about what's going on or what's about to happen. But getting back to today's talk, uh, I wonder if anyone who has been doing experiments to test Rupert Sheldrake's theory about morphogenic fields has followed up on uh, the anecdote that Dr. Weil talked about when he uh, described how Thorazine didn't seem to work as well on a second person in the same family. And doesn't that suggest uh, Rupert's theory of morphic resonance? You know, the mind boggles when you think of the possibilities. And so I'll leave it to you to speculate about that on your own. And by the way, uh, one of the places some of our fellow Saloners have been doing their speculating is in the comments section of our Notes from the Psychedelic Salon blog, which you can find at www.psychedelicsalon.org. In fact, I think of those blog comments as a kind of public form of email. So if you get the urge to comment on this or any of the podcasts from the Psychedelic Salon, well, that's a good place to start. And I should mention that you aren't just limited to adding comments to podcast topics. You can also start your own topic if there's something on your mind that you'd like to pass along or get comments on. Now, one thing about the talk uh, we just heard that kind of stood out, at least for me, was that I, I thought some of the comments about marijuana weren't uh, all that well informed. But of course, back in 1983, uh, hardly anyone was well informed about cannabis, least of all me. So I think uh, it speaks very well of the internet that so much good information about this plant has now been imprinted in so many minds around the world. And when it comes to information and news about cannabis, well, my first stop uh, now is the Cannabis Podcast Network. In case you've not been there yet, you can find them at dopefiend.co.uk. And uh, there you'll find a podcast for almost any psychedelic taste. My current favorite on their network is uh, a relatively new program called Lefty's Lounge. And once you hear him, I think you'll agree that Lefty has the best voice in cyberspace. He's sort of the Bing Crosby of podcasting, uh, for those of you who are old enough to know who Bing Crosby was. Now, some of the other programs on their network uh, include Zandor's Grow Report, which is a must-listen for any medical marijuana caregivers who are growing plants. And someone whose show is near and dear to me is Max Freakout of Psychonautica. I hope that uh, one day Max will enlarge on one of the topics Dr. Weil just touched on, and uh, that is the degree to which our expectations shape our experiences with these substances. My guess is that uh, he could add some interesting light on that subject. I've, I've learned a lot from listening to Max, and I, I really appreciate his commentary. And then, of course, there's the flagstone of the network, the Dopecast, hosted by the Dope Fiend. So by now, I suspect you're probably wondering whether I'm being paid to give this big plug for the Cannabis Podcast Network. And I was about to say no, because that's the truth, but then I remembered that the first time I became aware of this wonderful network of podcasters was when a package arrived in the mail last year. It came just a few weeks after I mentioned that I'd lost my MP3 player, and in that package was a brand new MP3 player, compliments of a fellow Saloner who called himself the Dope Fiend. So it really makes me feel good when I hear some of our other fellow Saloners have made contributions to the Dope Fiends network. You know, it, it kind of makes me feel like I'm indirectly paying him back in some way by helping to expand his audience as well. You know, after all, we're all in this together, you know. And that's a very long way to try to explain what seems to be going on with these podcasts. Not with the podcasters, but with you. You know, I've, I've never met Lefty or the Dope Fiend or KMO or Queer Ninja, but uh, I feel as if I've known them for years. And it's the same way with you. You know, if you stop by the salon each week, well... Like it or not, you've uh, become connected to a web of fellow saloners who, in turn, are interconnected with other webs uh, through other podcasts they frequent. And while this is uh, obviously nothing more than idle speculation on my part, I can't help but wonder whether uh, we're interconnecting our minds in some new way that actually could lead to what Teilhard called uh, the awakening of the newosphere.
But you know, even if we're doing nothing more than just creating a new version of Pen Pals, well, it's already quite spectacular for me. I'll give you just one more uh, example and then move on. But one day last week, when I checked my email, I found a message from KMO, host of the Sea Realm podcast and co-founder with Max Breakout of Psychonautica. Now, I knew that KMO was in the Amazon uh, at the time, and I was delighted to hear from him. But what really blew me away, though, was that he'd attached an audio postcard that he'd recorded uh, during a Wachuma session in the jungle. And it was a message from KMO and Pio, who is uh, also a fellow Saloner whose dad and I have probably crossed paths during our Navy days. I have to tell you that uh, hearing the love and joy in those two voices and knowing that they were in the care of a good ally and breathing the jungle air, well, it truly did warm the cockles of my heart. Whatever, whatever those may be, <laughs> I don't know if I have cockles in my heart, but I felt good when you guys sent that message and I do appreciate it. Another nice surprise came this week from uh, one of our fellow saloners that uh, you'll remember from a while back. Bill, who uh, makes his home in Japan, has now completed compiling the program notes for Terence McKenna's Valley of Nolly series, parts 4, 5, and 6. Now Bill, as you know, also did the program notes for the first three programs in that series. And I hope you get a chance to take a look at them, uh, because my guess is that you'll be surprised at how many things Terence said that you may have missed. Even if you've uh, heard those talks uh, half a dozen times or more, like I have, it really surprised me to read some of the quotes that uh, I have little, if any, memory of being so thought-provoking. And besides being a service for you DJs who are looking for easy ways to find McKenna sound bites for your mixes, having such uh, detailed program notes also lets Google do a pseudo-index of these podcasts and thus extend Terence McKenna's reach into minds that haven't yet found him. So thank you, Bill. Your work is much appreciated. And speaking of appreciation, today's podcast uh, comes to you in part through some fellow saloners who have made generous donations to us. So thank you, David R., Donald S., and Veeple P. Thank you again, and uh, thank you all. Your generosity is uh, greatly appreciated. And to you and to all the other wonderful donors of this podcast, uh, particularly those that haven't yet received a personal email thank you from me, well, what can I say except I'm a little behind, but I'll eventually get a note out to you, and I, I really do appreciate your thoughts and uh, comments and donations. And by the way, uh, several of our fellow saloners have mentioned their hesitation at making a donation to the Psychedelic Salon for fear of what might show up on your credit card statement. <laughs> and I don't blame you a bit, so uh, so I've just now sent myself a donation to see what kind of a paper trail it leaves, and uh, next week I'll, I'll let you know what I find out. But don't worry about sending donations, you guys. Uh, hey, I know that a lot of you are students or have families to feed, and that you also have to support other organizations and podcasts. I'll tell you what, just having you here with us in the salon each week is more than enough for me. And uh, if you tell a friend about these podcasts, well, that's even frosting on the cake, so to speak. But being here, uh, being a part of this ever-growing, far-reaching, and intertwining network of podcast families uh, is more than enough for me. So uh, thank you for joining us today here in the Psychedelic Salon. Well, before I go, I want to mention that this and all of the podcasts from the Psychedelic Salon are protected under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. And if you have any questions about that, just click the link on the bottom of the Psychedelic Salon page that says Creative Commons. Uh, and if you have any questions, comments, complaints, or suggestions about these podcasts, just send them to Lorenzo at MatrixMasters.com. Thanks again to Paul and Jay for this recording, and to Chateau Hayuk for the use of your music here in the salon. And thank you to Dr. Weil for all you've done to help medicine move into the modern age. Now next week, uh, in addition to our regular guest speaker, I'm going to be giving you some details about the Palenque Norte Plyologues that we'll be hosting at the Burning Man Festival this year. And even if you can't make it to the burn this year, I think the Plyologues may be of uh, interest to you, so stay tuned. Now before I go, I'd, uh, I'd like to ask you to spend just one minute of your time and send some love to Laura Huxley. As you know, uh, Laura is 96 years old now, 
and unfortunately uh, she took a bad fall that has required her to be in a cast. And it, it isn't going to be easy for Laura to be so confined because uh, up until her fall she was still living alone and going full steam ahead every day. So uh, please send her your love and let's hope that she moves on through this little setback with flying colors. And for now, this is Lorenzo signing off from Cyberdelic Space. Be well, my friends. Thank you.